just to build upon that uh, point of um, where you were suggesting that artists can be a source of, uh, of um, discomfort for those that they want to address, um, I was thinking about uh, the extent to which many of the panellists uh, approach this problem uh, by arguing defensively uh, for the custodianship of the past, uh, using words like minding the past or the beautification of the past or um, our identification with the past and therefore its comfort bestowing effects upon us. But I wonder where the challenge is in that, um, in th those sort of narratives. And this brings me particularly to the cultures of Greece and Rome, not just the past. I wonder if any of the panellists would um, buy the general idea that the study of the Greeks and Romans involves not only um, uh, the study of cultures to whom we're to which we're sort of intimately connected historically, but also um, the study of cultures that have the potential to challenge all of our natural assumptions about basic things which um, uh, you know, cease to be a problem in uh, our everyday lives. So I'm interested in the extent to which the past, you know, as the artist, as it were, to his, to his uh, benefactor, uh, the study of the past or the study of particular cultures can provide moments of challenge for us on a more profound cultural level forcing us to re-evaluate, receive wisdom, or naturalised assumptions, etc. It's a general question to the group. <laughs> <laughs> a comment well, and a question. Yes. I mean, reading the classics is in itself a challenge because it makes you think. I mean, you have, you have to think to understand. Uh, uh, I'm sort of taking an extreme uh, side, of course. Uh, you don't need to read the classics to think. But they make you think <laughs> in a different way. Uh, and thinking is part of what makes us what we are. Unless we think and we trouble ourselves with thinking, we won't go forward. And I find that the classics are, do that to us. Uh, when you read a new text for the first time, you may be surprised the first time that <coughs> how similar their feelings were to ours. You know, it's an easy thing to do. But then you go beyond that and you realize the basic human values for which we should still strive. Um, My suggestion is about fundamental and radical difference as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the sort of space that I'm suggesting is missing from the, from the narratives we've heard so far, the space of radical alterity, you know? I, I, well, <laughs> I think he's inviting a, a, a certain discourse, which is absolutely right. I think there are two reasons, very broadly, why one should study the Greeks and the Romans. One is because they are quite like us. And they're quite like us for two reasons. One, they're humans. And secondly, they invented all kinds of institutions which we still benefit from, or perhaps don't benefit from. But at any rate, there is something about the way they organize themselves that is relevantly similar. But Demetrius's point, he was actually, I think, responding to you, but in a rather sort of nice way. Um, the, I mean, just let me give you one straight obvious illustration. Most of us, I take it here, were brought up in one or other monotheistic faith. Am I correct? I doubt that many of us here are either by birth, by education, or by current conviction polytheists in a thoroughgoing way. Well, the world is completely different if you imagine that the world is full of many gods and goddesses and heroes and heroines and that potentially anything is set sacralizable, sacred, and um, just taking that point, answering the question before about let's just stick to theatre. Going to the theatre in Athens or in Epilabros in the fourth century was a religious experience in a significant sense. In other words, not simply that the presiding deity was a god, the, pres the president of the whole uh, function, but that you were in some way worshipping the divinity by watching a play about matters which involve relations between the human and the divine. And one vision, one version of what Athenian tragedy of the 5th century, and I say that very specifically, not Greek tragedy, Athenian tragedy, not of any century, of the 5th century, is that it's setting at risk, it's challenging, it's inviting the audience to think how things could be so different from the world in which they actually live, which was the world's first functioning human democratic community. 
Now, the next point again. The ancient Greeks are very like us. The word democracy is a Greek word. But you don't have to go very far before you realize that ancient Greek democracy, and that is the many hundreds of cities that practice different versions of democracy, are all radically different in at least one fundamental respect. All of them were direct. All of ours are representative or indirect. And that is fundamental, utterly fundamental. It implies a totally different mindset. So if you were to imagine a trades union meeting at which the decision is to be taken by ra raising the right hand or hand, and that is the decision of that trades union, it is its policy. Well, in Athens, they might be deciding we go to war, we die tomorrow. Or we make peace, and so we alter the way in which we interact. So every day, the Athenian democracy, in principle, might radically alter its current social political <coughs> behavior. It's just unimaginable to us today. So similarity as well as difference. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up, maybe. Yeah. I'm Michael Williams from the Department of Classics at Beneath. I'm wondering, just to follow up on some of these questions. Could you just make it a, a little bit louder? Yeah. I wonder whether the different places of Greece and Rome need to be articulated a little bit more here. There seems to be a tendency, which I find very interesting, to go back through Rome to Greece. And Greece tends to be valorized as the origin of all of these things that we are interested in at the moment. When you think of the classics, we kind of go back even through Virgil's Georgics, who end up looking back to Hesiod and to Homer. So I wonder whether there is a problem in fitting Rome into this kind of, at least chronological discourse, if we're going back for origins, or whether there is some alternative place that we can find for Rome, or whether there's actually no problem here at all. And I don't mind who answers that. <coughs> well, I tried to use the classical world rather than classical Greece on purpose, because I include Rome as much as Greece in the development of uh, our society, of our uh, spe species. Uh, and of course, e although I'm a Greek, I have to, I um, mean, a Greek speaker, uh, I have to admit that most, uh, Euro a lot of European languages are derived from Latin, not from Greek, even though a lot of Greek words are uh, and have entered into them. But yes, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I, that's why I was using the, <coughs> the classical world. Uh, I put them together. I should say, it wasn't meant as a criticism. But no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also also yeah, and I also included Rome Byzantium, it's so it's, it's all these cultures that build one on the other. And I think you mentioned that one builds on the other, and it's necessary for that. Uh, could, could I just make a brief comment on that, because that's a question I'm, I'm actually quite interested in. Clearly, there are huge differences between uh, Roman civilization and Greek civilization. But what's, what is important to remember, I think, is that they both have had fundamental impacts on our, our world and our way of thinking, and uh, indeed our <laughs> way of thinking about uh, uh, democracy. Because one of the things that really fascinates me is that in 5087 BC, we have what we often refer to as the beginnings of Athenian democracy. In 509, the Romans actually expelled their kings and established what they called a republic. And if you look at Roman republicanism and you look at Greek democracy, while they diverge sharply from each other, uh, it is a remarkable thing that almost simultaneously they both evolved heading in a similar direction, even though they didn't get to the same place. But both of them, if you look at modern democracy, I think, you'll see that the impact of Roman republicanism is as great. Now, Paul will probably argue with me about this. It's as great or greater in its impact on the way we think about governing states and the relationships between uh, the state and the citizen than, uh, than the Greek model. So uh, you know, there are, there, there are differences. And you learn from the difference, and you learn, f I think, but in both of them, in that particular instance and in other instances, have had, uh, I think, a seminal influence on the way our society thinks about fundamental things. Yes, stand up if you would. <coughs> 
Uh, my name is Carol Green. I just started my first year here at Trinity, so I've only been here for about two weeks. <laughs> Before this, I was in a secondary school system of education that gave me a classical education that could be summarized very comfortably on one A4 page. Uh, anything I know about Greece and Rome, I've gone on and found myself on the internet or in books or wherever, but I have received virtually no classical education from the state. I was wondering, what's the panel's view on should a classical education be reintroduced into state education? Should people receive that kind of education from the state through state education? Or should it be something that they are invited to come to, but aren't given in school? Forced. Forced. <laughs> Anybody wish? Yeah, I, I would love to. I, I, I think it should be on the curriculum. You know, you know so, certainly we're talking. You, I don't know anything about the politics of Greek and Roman um, life, but we did. Uh, you know, we learned about the plan of a, of a Roman house, and that was all we learned, really, and a bit of Ovid. Um, but I think, yeah, certainly the, the mythology, I think, would really enrich um, the education in this country because there's so much references uh, of that in every, um, every uh, writing and, um, in the world, you know? So I'd, I'd agree. But you know, getting, back, getting back to that, one thing I was saying to Simon before I came in here, there's a, you know, that how it functions in, in, in the youth like yourself of, of the world. You know, Monty Python did this fantastic... Uh, video where they had a soccer match between the ancient Greeks and the German <laughs> philosophers. And, they had, and you should all YouTube it when you go home because it is absolutely fantastic and Confucius is the ref. But you have, you know, you have Socrates, Aristotle, and they're all in perfect outfits and they're all shooting goals. And you have Wittgenstein and Heidegger and everything. But I think any young person or older person like me watching that, I immediately go, is there some thought in why Heidegger is better than Wittgenstein? You know? So there, there are, you know. How do you make this stuff seep into education? I think is a massively good question because it's so dry. The way we're given education in this country, I think, is is dry, it's terribly dry. You know. Anyway. And not only in your country, I'm afraid. Even in my country, we are moving away from our own past with the simplification of the classical language. I mean, uh, my children cannot read classical Greek, and they've had a perfectly good education. And the system has changed so much recently that we really have to go back and do something about it. We are proud of our language, but we are soon losing its significance. So, yeah. Interesting there, yeah. Uh, so stand up. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jamie Parker. I've just finished my education in school, and I was lucky enough to uh, be able to study Latin and Greek. Uh, but to study Greek, you know, I had to go out of my way, go to a summer school. Um, and I, I went to the British Museum, I saw the Elgin Marbles, and um, Professor Cartwright there was, was talking about whether they should be moved to the Acropolis. And, I, I mean, to me, it's so much more accessible in London, and I think to most people in the world, <laughs> <laughs> most people in the world, I agree with you that, for almost anyone, unless you're a professor, to go to Athens and see the Parthenon, I mean, it'd be great if you could see the Elgin Marbles without the Parthenon, but it's, it's not really practical. And I think if you want to... <laughs> 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 You know, kidneys and wonderful Pasco um, resources globally available. I think, you know, somewhere like London is a great place to store them. There's no need to make more things. Like Greece doesn't think that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, that should <laughs> ignite a <laughs> <your> fire. <laughs> yeah, okay, would you stand up, please? To answer your question, uh, I wanted to say that um, I come from France, and in France, well, we have the chance to study Latin and Greek uh, at high school, so during 10 years approximately, and um, that uh, the actual government is trying to, of course, <laughs> reduce, like in so many other countries, uh, the hours of Latin and Greek, and that um, I think it would be a very good idea to introduce it in the general uh, curriculum, and as well as for Irish, because I think there's a link also if you study uh, Greek and Latin mythology, and Irish mythology, uh, there are great resemblances, and um, I think that you, you, uh, the government should try to uh, continue to promote uh, the Irish, Latin, and Greek uh, as part of a general curriculum. Good. Thank you very much for that. May I ask? Sorry. We we have a comment here. Oh right. right. May I add a, a remark to that and to the. To young man who spoke, uh, 
I think any of us would say that we would uh, prefer if uh, Latin, at least, were available in the schools. But to say it even sounds like a wishful thinking, because uh, I think there's just such little chance of it happening. Um, but one reason that doesn't seem to be considered for it is that I believe if people uh, at young age were learning Latin, there would be an increased chance of them preserving English and learning our own language better. And I don't think that comes into it. And, and I think it should. Um, somehow the discipline of a classical language would just enhance the chances of English, uh, the decline, the deterioration of English being halted somewhat. And for that reason, I would love it. Uh, and I would chain myself to the railings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Hello, hi. Yes. Um, I study classics at Trinity, and I've often pondered uh, whether my degree is utterly selfish. Um, to be honest, uh, I think classics can be perceived as a bit of vice, really, just to say drinking alcohol was or going to sit. <laughs> um, what real use does it have in the world that we live in? One which is so concentrated on money and you know conflict and disease <coughs> and everything like that. I mean, could you honestly tell me that it's more useful for me to study Latin and Greek for four years here than, say, to study medicine? Could I ask you why did you decide to study Latin? Oh, because yeah. I'm utterly selfish. You might be a lousy doctor. This is the advice I always give to my students when they ask me similar questions. If that is what you really want to do, that's what you should do because that's the best thing you can do. Everything else will be a compromise. If that's what you really want to do. Otherwise, don't do it. Um, yeah. Philip De Souza, I'm head of the School of Classics at University College. <laughs> I, I don't have anything to disagree with in terms of the points you're making, but it seems to me that one of the core issues that people are getting at here is how much elbow room should classics be allowed in various educational and cultural structures and institutions. And I think that's something that can never be fixed, it can't be determined that there must be, so when somebody said force people to do Latin in Irish state schools, of course not. But the opportunity needs to be provided, and that is what something, that's something that relates to the wider, I think was intended to be the wider issue in this forum, why study the past? Why study all of these things that don't actually currently contribute to reducing the massive debt of the national economy? <laughs> Because learning, studying, improving your mind, as Professor Mitchell said, improving your emotional interaction with culture and the things that make you both happy and afraid are intrinsically worthwhile in themselves. Because the past, and in particular the classical past, is always good to think with. Because it's wonderfully attractive and just so fascinating. And because it will make you like all these people here. <laughs> we, of course, are a, a, an audience that, to a large extent, I expect, doesn't need convincing. There is another audience. Uh, which direction is it? Um, that way. That way. Um, that way. That absolutely does. That says, if humanities research and education does not immediately contribute to the massive debt that we're running up with this NAMA institution, it doesn't matter and we shouldn't care a cent about it. So please go away from here with the intention to, in some sense, make them over there appreciate <laughs> that it's not a question of why should we, it's how much more opportunity should we have Sorry, I've got a bit carried away. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to just make one point from my, from my experience. We have to remember that this building, which is a very expensive, high-quality building, was largely built with 
state money through the PRTLI program, which was originated by Atlantic Philanthropies, but has been taken over now exclusively by the state. So, you know, we have to remember that uh, the people over there in Kildare Street are not all incurable Philistines. <laughs> and that we, uh, uh, we I, I mean, we should bear that in mind that, that uh, you know, our society has not become so commercialized that they have lost appreciation of uh, the fundamental value uh, to not just providing a life, but what I would call uh, providing a living, but providing a life for people and realize the value of education as a way of enhancing uh, our capacity to get more out of our lives. So uh, we, should, um, uh, we should not give up on the state. <laughs> Yes, yeah. uh, I'm uh, Christina Haywood, colleague of Phillips here, and um, I'm um, a former conservator and I'm also a curator of the Classical Museum here, I guess. So I just, because uh, of the presence of uh, Professor Michael Davis, we have to bring up also a bit of conservation here, because uh, his, 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 uh, his uh, part in the committee for the conservation of uh, mosaics, the preservation of mosaics. And I mean, we've been talking about, you know, uh, why do we study the classics? Why do we want to preserve the past is another big question, really. Uh, and uh, uh, whether you could expand on this, because uh, for it's very controversial. Even in Ireland, in the, in the Irish setting, when uh, sites are discovered, you know, there are interests, other interests that actually interfere. And uh, suddenly one loses sight of the importance of the past, because there are other interests that, that in the, and, uh, and uh, antiquities are destroyed very often, and so on. Uh, so so it's an expensive exercise to preserve the past. Why, according to you, is it worth doing? Oh, difficult. Well, not difficult, a complex question. Uh, w as I said, at the beginning when this uh, organization was formed, there was very little interest. Because mosaics, you know, we have many mosaics in the world. Who cares if we lose a few of them? Uh, but uh, the rate of loss in the last few decades is so incredible. We are losing more than it's being excavated per year. So very soon we won't have mosaics unless we take care of them. And taking care is something new because, as I said, uh, many countries, even if they don't, if the mosaics are not part of their own culture, I'll give you, for example, Tunisia. Tunisia has more mosaics uh, than any other country. They were not made by the present day Tunisians, but they are part of their culture and they have now identified with those things. And Tunisia, although it's not one of the richest countries in the world, is investing more in the conservation of its past, its mosaics in particular, just because they have become emblematic of their culture. This is Tunisian culture. It's also a source of income, as I mentioned. A lot of tourists go to Tunisia to look at those things. But uh, above all, it is this sudden realization of what we are losing. Uh, most people think of conservation as happening in museums. Museum is a controlled environment. It has all its problems, of course, but there are objects, you deal with them. But the sites that are exposed to the elements of nature, and 99.9% .9 of mosaics are, they are being lost. Uh, very soon, we will have very little left unless something is done. And some countries have realized this, and this is why we have this incredible interest in the society. And I mentioned that we have countries uh, as members that don't have mosaics. Uh, we have uh, uh, representatives from countries in Central Africa, for example, from Australia, uh, from places you would never associate with mosaics. The reason they've joined is because they have identified with the need of preserving the past. Uh, it's not necessarily the mosaics. It's the past and what it means for us, and also the methodology, because as an organization, we teach, uh, or rather preach, the methodology that should be employed, which includes shelters, uh, roofing ancient sites, or less ancient sites, which is a very controversial issue. But they are all part of this recent uh, 
awakening to the fact of the r rate at which we are losing things. I don't know if I've answered your question. You yes, don't seem yes, satisfied. You did. I just, um, <laughs> yes, the conflict, a little bit, you know, in the, sense, the conflict between, you know, modern society and the preservation of the of the past, and how is it that we uh, can, uh, you know, uh, pr project this? Uh, you know, it seems that there's such a, such a big, you know, kind of conflict between um, the sometimes, you know, uh, the, this different, um, um, you know, interests that are, you know, yours to preserve it and. Uh, uh, people sort of developers to, to destroy it. And the only way you can work against that is to teach the local people to be the caretakers of their culture. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, we have a gigantic project with the Getty Foundation, my, or my the, the organization I'm heading, and ICROM in Rome, it's called Mosaicon, is a multi-million project, and it involves, at the present stage, uh, 12 countries, all the Mashrek and the Maghreb, uh, with Turkey, Cyprus, and Israel as the sort of three extras. Uh, and what we are doing is educating, uh, doing these workshops, training workshops, at all levels starting from the technicians that actually sweep the mosaics and going through the site managers and up the scale, even to the ministers uh, that are responsible for the care of cultural heritage. Uh, it's difficult at the top, very difficult at the top. Uh, but we are winning at the bottom. Uh, and you see in Tunisia, in uh, sites like Nabel and Neapolis, ancient Neapolis, the locals are the people we trained, and they look after the sites like their own houses, and they are proud of that. And through them, we are exercising pressure higher up. Uh, it's the only way, because if you start at the top, you'll get a no straight away. It's only if it comes from the people themselves that identify with something. Okay, well, I, I, I just want to say, I, th I think this has the appearance of a discussion that could continue for a very long time. It's full of interest, and I, I'm uh, very grateful and delighted by your response. But uh, I know that at least some of you have homes to go to, so I think you know, we should <laughs> soon, soon draw it to a close. So I, I think perhaps two well, more questions, later. Brian, would that be all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, I Sorry, yeah. Um, could I just re um, reply to the good head of the department from UCD? Uh, I studied modern history and Spanish, and I think what perhaps the reply you might get from the scientific uh, community and the, uh, the eco economic community that you were, you were speaking to, to bring them around, would be, um, you know, what, not just what um, value it has, as you say, opening your mind and so on, but it would come back to perhaps what Professor Cartlidge said, he, he mentioned the introduction, you introduced the idea of the divine operating at a theatrical level and the importance of the interrelationship between the gods and the humans in some aspect of Athenian performance, which I'm not familiar with, I'm say. But what, what I would say that the secularists would reply that we live in the postmodernist world. And if I was to be on their side, we live in the post enlightenment world. And why should we be introducing, once again, in the European Union? God back into it and, and, and the divine, seeing that in Ireland, Latin, and this is not what I believe myself actually, but I see the, I've heard the argument, and I see that we're living in a relativistic society. So what right have anyone to impose ideas of beliefs of the gods performing some role in our society when the European Union and the Irish education, well, I've taught the Irish secondary system, <coughs> and many of the people complained that Latin was used by the church for their own purposes, you know, whatever, whatever you think of that. And therefore, so is it not an infringement? And that, you, you know, your arguments, therefore, your, your role is to comment on the arts. Your role is to, as an entertainment. I mean, this is something that I think would be a response given to, to that question, if I yeah. just... Yeah. There is an ancient response to that very interesting response, which is that we should all be Epicureans. In other words, there are gods, or at least we think there may be gods, uh, 
but they have nothing to do with us. <laughs> and um, the other dimension that's relevant to that is that Lucretius, following Epicurus, was, as it were, scientific. So he is a direct ancestor, intellectually, of Darwin. And I infer that you're some kind of secularist yourself. Not well. I mean, yes. Anyway, perhaps <laughs> not entirely hostile to the ideas of Charles Darwin. At any rate, and there is, in other words, an ancient lineage, an intellectual, not of course a physical, empirical lineage from antiquity to modernity through Darwin, who actually hated classics because he was forced to do Latin and Greek, because he came from that background, that level in society, and he actually hated learning Latin and Greek, yet he actually preserves in some way a classical tradition. You can't escape it. <laughs> <laughs> one, one final question. Yes. Um, hi, Del Watson. I'm the auditor of the Classical Society here at Trinity. Um, over the summer, I went to Thessaloniki in northern Greece and noticed that there are a load of excavation sites where they're trying to build a metro system, but obviously every time they dig for a site, they find another archaeological ruin which then they have to excavate properly before they can progress. And the locals are finding that they think that it's the future is being held off by this persistence in looking at the past. And that's what they're looking at today on that. Mm. I'll just say Athens had exactly the same problem, and they solved it in very imaginative. Obviously, it held up the future in the sense that things had to be excavated, but they built into the present and the future actually the record of the past. So if you go to the um, two um, most useful underground stations in uh, Athens, one is called Acropolis, one is called Sicyon, you will actually see a section. So that tells you what modern archaeology is, what the history of the Athenian uh, habitation is, is, plus the metro in Athens is, I think, one of its most attractive modern contemporary features uh, in a post-industrial world. The metro, the metro, is terrific in Athens. So you can both learn and move around very quickly. And I simply add that, okay, people are complaining that things are being delayed, but what has really been delayed, and I don't want to speak at it about against Greece, what has been delayed is the actual making of the metro. It should have happened ages ago. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, Peter, may I say that uh, we know only too well here that we don't have to go as far east as you're speaking about, for example. Um, my home in North County Meath uh, is on the route of the uh, notorious M3, uh, which you know, just violates a whole ancient sacred valley. Part of the defense of the proponents of this were, was that uh, it, it's actually further from the Hill of Tara than the old N3, uh, which sounds to me a little like someone saying, well, I, I don't hit my children as hard as somebody else did or something, <laughs> impossibility. But a question earlier, and if, if I may just refer to what I think were two people's uh, questions about the cost of preservation, and uh, was, if I understood part of your question, an observation like, uh, is there something of just an academic nation, uh, nature and luxury about a certain preservation and conservation of the past? I think that it's more than both of those things. I think it's part of a human responsibility because the opposite is irresponsible. And I think it's more than uh, a matter of finance and more than a matter of the academy. If, if you contemplate that moment again further east, uh, when, do you remember, the Taliban took to destroying the statues? I mean, just people felt an affront People felt, with no cultural investment in that particular landscape or community or, 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 or tribe or, or country, people felt some uh, pain uh, to watch this. And I think at that human level, uh, there is an indication of, of something at the core of our being that matters. Um, and I think it's beyond money, and I think it's beyond the academy yeah. and the luxury. Yeah. And also, I, yeah. I, I just think the, uh, the guy who said he was selfish, it's the opposite to selfish. It's difficult what you're doing, and it, that makes it valuable. 
actually. So I, I, I don't think you should be that flippant about yourself. You have a fantastic foundation. You know, you're lucky. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry to have to draw to a close because uh, it's, it's getting more interesting and more interesting. <laughs> I don't think we just have an audience of the converted here. We've had a lot of very divergent views. And we had, of course, a very divergent... Uh, panel, and I think they were all brilliant and uh, made fantastic inputs that we'll, that we'll uh, lo long remember. So I'd like to, uh, to thank them for coming here. Some of them came quite a good distance uh, to, to, to be at this event. So, thank Peter, Dorothy, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think you could give yourselves a good clap as well because you have also been brilliant uh, in your contributions yeah. and in the diversity of it. So thank you also. Can I, uh, can I just uh, briefly say there is a glass of wine upstairs uh, for and uh, to, to talk with uh, our guests. And, uh, uh, the Metro and uh, listen, the Nidhi may have been delayed, but our glass of wine has been delayed by this classical discussion. Uh, so you're all very welcome. Uh, upstairs, and if I could just thank Professor Mitchell for sharing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>